Ladies and gentlemen, dear fleet colleagues, welcome to this global fleet webinar organized with the support of G Capital. My name is Steven Schufs and I am Chief Editor of Global Fleet. How do we define globalization in today's environment? Well, as you know, borders are fading, globalization is increasing, so we notice it on a daily basis, be it with regard to economy, culture or society. But where business is concerned, global doesn't bear one definition only. Some companies will do business on all six continents, while some are only present in a few continents in Europe and the US, for example. This applies to the fleet industry as well. On top of this, new economies have arisen and are growing in the global picture of our business activities. By working on a global scale, companies try to increase efficiencies with regard to production and processes, and with a focus on cost, globalization, including in fleet management, can bring economies of scale. But only if all parameters are taken into account and careful attention ought to be paid to local complexities. Your global fleet strategy, when designed at a global level, will eventually have to be implemented at a local level. So having a so-called global mindset is key for success. Think global, act local, as our global fleet motto states. As I mentioned, with this webinar we will try and determine what the key findings of the Global Fleet Conference 2014 were in terms of trends and strategies. Afterwards, Joe La Rosa, Director Global Fleet Services at Merck, Sharp and Dome, will shed some light on how they have successfully developed and implemented the Global Fleet Strategy. Finally, Mr. Florian Waldegger, Global Fleet Consulting Manager at G Capital, will explain how from the supplier side they can support your development and implementation of your global fleet strategy. So first of all let me briefly introduce the lessons learned at the Global Fleet Conference this year. In May-June this year Global Fleet carried out a survey on global fleet management trends and the results were introduced at our conference. It appears that the vast majorities of respondents intend to globalize the management of their fleet in the near future, as you can see it in the graph. Overall, 78% of the respondents intend to globalize their strategy within the next five years. Only 20% are not considering it at all. This means that the interest for centralized fleet approaches and the interest for globalization is still growing. What's more, during the Global Fleet Conference, all case study speakers, hence fleet managers, highlighted the fact that in order to successfully manage the Global Fleet strategy, a strong mandate is really necessary. In order to manage change at local level and to counter local resistance or skepticism, Global Fleet managers, as you know probably, need to have internal support and power so as to make decisions and ensure efficient local implementation. The mandate is also crucial to keep the momentum and drive the Global Fleet Management project. When it comes to Global Fleet Management, one size doesn't fit all. And when going global, fleet managers have to take into account local elements, be it culture, legislation, the local offer. They ought to bear in mind that the global car fleet strategy will have to establish principles and guidelines that will leave some room for flexibility and ownership at a local level. Another one of the key findings of our conference is that when it comes to the relationship with suppliers, be it OEMs, leasing companies or insurance companies, fleet managers find that transparency is still a huge challenge. Fleet customers expect to have a clear and detailed view on all costs at the global level and as it turns out, it seems that suppliers are not always meeting their needs. So in a nutshell, these were some of the key findings of our conference. However, we have to bear in mind that all suppliers also have to deal with local differences and challenges as well. And so, 
transparency as fleet managers seem to expect it is close to utopia. After all, it's also a partnership that you have with your suppliers and so a matter of trust is required. In line with this, fleet managers highlighted the lack of global fleet reporting. The logic explanation for this can be that suppliers aren't present everywhere, which means that most of the time fleet managers have to work with several suppliers globally. Hence collating, integrating, analyzing all your data in one structured, easy to use online platform is for the moment almost impossible. And so often the options are either to work with different reporting tools and or an Excel genius afterwards. As far as trends are concerned, the Global Fleet Survey underlined the fact that CO2 has become a predominant concept in our fleet management. Our survey showed that already today CO2 targets are primarily managed at the global level. On top of this, fleet managers who attended the Global Fleet Conference insisted on the importance of driver behavior and safety. Of course, the costs can't be calculated up front, but they nevertheless have a great impact on the total cost of ownership, the TCO, which is why fleet managers are increasingly trying to integrate those aspects in their global fleet policies. And the last important aspect of fleet management, which led to animated discussions during our conference, was telematics. Telematics is a strong point of focus for the coming years now I will leave the floor to our speakers, Joe and Florian. I would like to leave the floor to Joe LaRosa. Joe. Okay, well, thank you, Stephen. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our uh, people on, on the uh, webinar here. Thank you very much for this time. Um, I guess, as uh, we said, you know, what really... Uh, did it take uh, for uh, change management? That's really what had to happen at Merck. And although I start out here with the merger with Sharing Plow, it actually started about two years prior to that. Um, when I actually came into uh, uh, Merck in 2007, in the latter part of 2007, and uh, what we found was that there was really <clears throat> a lack of standard global processes um, at Merck to establish any type of uh, uh, management over inventory of, of vehicles. Uh, but at the time of the uh, of the merger with uh, Sharing Plow, what we were faced with uh, was essentially um, <clears throat> a category within Merck. <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, catapulted the fleet spend category, and what we had realized was that uh, we were spending close to about $400 million on fleet, um, and that wasn't even including capital. That was strictly just an operating expense, and then we had, um, you know, we didn't even have a true count of uh, the number of vehicles, and uh, what we had, uh, you know, essentially it took us months to realize that we had close to 40,000 vehicles. Um, but so we clearly had to establish some type of uh, management and, and control over that. Um, so we put together, uh, even prior to the, uh, to the merger, what we put together was a Six Sigma process. And in that process, we started to come up, as you, you know, some of you are well aware, of, of the Sigma process. And that is one to determine, well, what, what is, the, what is your, you know, your problem statement? And that's where we really found that the biggest problem that we were faced with was that uh, there was a lack of standard processes around uh, around the globe. Um, and one of the things was that we, you know, we really couldn't con you know control. There was no control over the in inventory of vehicles. Um, no one was controlling operating costs. And then that just led to just further furtherance of problems in managing your fleet. The biggest thing was that we weren't leveraging our manufacturing buy. In Europe alone, we were we were buying from 21 different manufacturers. Um, even 21 was probably a loose number. Um, we found out later that they were they were buying you know from local manufacturers that weren't even 
uh, listed in that. And that that's you know in that sense we were buying from local suppliers even in the warehousing uh, you know managing our, our warehousing. Um, and uh, no one really cared about CO2 reductions, uh, fuel consumption. And then where our biggest issue was policy management. We had uh, local policies where they were, you know, HR policies is what I'm talking about there, where they were making offers of, uh, you know, to, to uh, you know, offer management vehicles to a particular attraction of, uh, of, of employees. Uh, you know, offering particular types of you know, name brand vehicles that were well out of reach of even some of the managing directors in other countries. So that was, you know, creating a much more problematic, you know, across you know certain European countries. Um, and then we also realized that we needed to change, change the way we're managing fuel up because there was very limited visibility operating fleet as one entity, as I just uh, just kind of stated there. So, uh, so I had the enviable, you know, task of then trying to control this. So, what we realized, you know, in that signal process, that we really had to have our first operating goal, and that was given to me. They said, "Okay, well, what were you going to do about this, Mr. Larosa?" And that was, well, through basically, you know, policy savings, is that we could probably, at a minimum, at a minimum, the challenge to me was to cut at least 10% of cost over the first year. So that was really the challenge, was to cut at a minimum about $40 million just through effective governance. And now, you know, we, this is now six, you know, almost six years down the road since 2009 as far as, you know, model years and all that. And we, we well surpassed that 10% 10, 10 minimum. And what we did there is just through, you know, basic global fleet governance and proper policy management. And that's really where we started. We started with the OEMs, where we looked at our global and regional contracts uh, through professional fleet management, environmental health and safety, CO2 policy management. Really had to really take control of our H and R comp and benefit and coordination. Uh, we we you know really surpassed uh, that that goal of uh, of savings. So Stephen, if you, you wouldn't mind going to the next. Uh, uh, slide, please. Um, so, you know, and that's really how we each get that goal. But, you know, more importantly, and I'll talk a little about it later, is that who we actually had managing our fleet. And I use the term management very, very, very loosely. Um, what we really had out there was administrators. And we had approximately almost 40 administrators around the globe. And I say administrators. So we had people in uh, facilities management, for example, HR management, and uh, we even we even had uh, pe people, you know, in in uh, warehousing that uh, they just happened to have as maybe 10 percent or maybe 20 percent of their role, and they would just say, well, today you're going to manage fleet for us or administer fleet, and they really didn't care about the cost, and that was really the state at which Mark was at in 2007 when I came on board. And these were people that were just, you know, responsible for just, you know, managing the keys or basically, you know, hey, you know, um, uh, you know, spare spare inventory management or whatever. But essentially, they were just responsible for maybe managing the local contracts with, you know, a local provider or some type of administration over fleet management. And you know, they had. Um, you know, let's say, you know, in some some of the uh, Eastern Bloc, you know, countries in, in Europe, uh, you know, this person, you know, would be the, uh, you know, the under facilities management. That person would be, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, the person who was, you know, the clerk in, in the front office and just would be uh, the person who was managing fleet or administering fleet. So this is typically uh, how fleet was managed throughout you know, work, and uh, so no one really was, you know, watching the store, as we say. Um, so we really needed that through its its goals. We needed to set um, someone to control the end-to-end -end process. You know, who was really going to be buying the cars should have been done through a local procurement office, and then who was going to be selling those cars that should have been, you know, through, um, you know, through again either through a local a fleet management office, and, and that just was never really coordinated. But we needed to have some type of guidance, and I think Stephen had mentioned that before. Um, so, but 
we really didn't want to have um, the global suite office, which I was now going to be responsible for, to own policy at a corporate level. That was going to be very taboo. And so what we set up, we said, well, look, let's start establishing a, uh, a guidance. So we came up with an original 18 guiding principles, and we established a governance um, behind that. And essentially part of um, that was to bring in um, <clears throat> people from environmental health and safety, corporate human resources, corporate comp and bands, and we needed to get their sponsorship. And so we started to meet on a regular basis, and we were able to get high-level sponsorship from my, my senior leadership. And then so we established this Corporate Governance Council. And then one of the first things that we did was we came up in the, with an original 18 guiding principles. The first of which, the first six were written by, uh, of all, it was HR and the second six were written by environmental health and safety. And then the last six I was tasked with uh, between myself and global procurement. We wrote the last six were, which were specific to uh, fleet management. And that's how we started out. And then we actually used an HR tool. And this was all part of um, the uh, HR toolkit that was part of the harmonization after the merger was um, uh, was announced and then we set that out. So essentially uh, through the Governance Council with Joe and Osha from Global Procurement and Fleet Operations, this is how we push this out. So this guiding principle and the Governance Council was going to be kind of like a living, um, a living document and then today we, we actually have now established three additional guiding principles as we started to gain experience on this and that's where we are today. We have additional three guiding principles um, as we started to get pushbacks. And I think as Stephen mentioned before, you had to have flexibility. And that's exactly what we have. One of, one of the overall uh, reaching things that we have in our guiding principles is that we do have an exception policy. So, um, uh, so the way I was um, organized, we have uh, a North America team, we have a Latin America team, we have a Europe team, and we have an Asia Pacific uh, Japan team. And essentially each one of those are governed uh, and then the locals uh, policies, we have concurrence rights uh, over the local policies. <clears throat> and we've actually received many accolades from specifically in the Asia Japan region where They've actually come to my local team, uh, the person that works for me sits in Sydney, and they've actually come to say, you know, we, we really appreciate these guiding principles because we never knew how to write our policies. Now you've given us guidance. And uh, they now go to them and, you know, uh, we, we actually get to see their policies. We get to sign off on them. And then as the uh, corporate HR comp and bends, they will not sign off on any of the policies until they see our signatures on that. So Stephen, can uh, I ask you please to go to the next slide, please? All right. So we, uh, we did have some challenges and experience in planning global code. So we did start out strong in the very mature markets, obviously North America and EMEA. Uh, we were able to get, you know, the policies going, you know, flying, you know, colors. We did get a lot of pushback. And, and EMEA HR, but we did work with comp and vans and HR, and I was there. Uh, the biggest challenge we kind of had uh, in Latin America, because in, uh, in in the MSD, I guess through financial policies, we uh, we are basically a bought or a purchased market, which which led to some other issues. Because even even from a tool vehicle, the employee is uh, part of their benefit is to buy. Um, uh, a certain percentage of the vehicles, so we had some challenges there, particularly outside of Brazil and Mexico. Um, but you know, we were able to adapt in, in, in certain things within policy in the locals, and we adapted. And that was one of the 19th <laughs> that happened, that led to the 19th guiding principle. Uh, but we were able to overcome that. Uh, and then we had some challenges in Asia Pac, as I said, but uh, with the rollout of, of the governance policies, but through some flexibility, uh, we were able to do that. But that also led to when we went through our second iteration of our OEM policy that we actually were able to bring in an Asian OEM that actually wound up being a, a global OEM that we're actually benefiting um, 
that today. So, um, and we are are looking at some really pretty big long-term savings on that. So, so you know, although we started out saying, you know, how are we going to implement this? We actually, by having a a, a second iteration waiting uh, on our OEM selection process, we actually are are, are uh, actually betting, benefiting that quite quite good today. So, Stephen, if I could have the last slide there. So, uh, so our next steps is basically um, we're continually being challenged. Not only I think uh, for those on the phone that are or, or know that from the formats that we've been, but I think in other businesses, we're continually being caught up in corporate reorganization. Uh, so, for example, when we started out in 2007, we had upwards of about 38 to 40 people managing fleet. Today, I'm down to four people. I, uh, a year ago, I had 12 on staff. Uh, eight months ago, I had eight. Now today, I'm down to four. So we're continually pushing more out uh, professionally, trying to manage sleep from the outside, and we'll continually be challenged on that. So it's extremely important to rely on professional sleep management companies and your fleet lease codes around the globe. And um, we're looking to those to push out fleet administration, funding, and management to those. So that's where our challenges are next, and that's where we're going to be um, meeting those challenges uh, head on. Uh, and, and the important thing is we need to make that transparent to our driver. Florian, we are all ears. Thank you very much, Stephen, and uh, especially for allowing me to present from GNET's consultancy perspective what will be key to success in a global fleet management. And also thank you, Stephen and Chill, for your insights. I have to agree with what you said earlier. On this page of my presentation, I would like to highlight what will be crucial for us as has been figured out from us while supporting customers on their projects. The intention of implementing a successful global fleet management is so strategically to build form and drive a community within your organization. Of course, the benefit should be in simplifying processes, aligning approaches and car policies across all poles, and last but not least, combining your sourcing power. All these topics will lead into proper cost savings, global appearance, and of course, a positive impact on your corporate social responsibility report. Therefore, it will be mandatory to develop from the beginning a clear vision and strategy to get from the management board the mandate to drive the implementation and also to secure the control of the decision process. What the content of your strategy might be is something I will show you later on. Let me focus first on some golden rules to simplify your role as a global fleet manager. Identify and involve the right key stakeholders from the beginning. This means not only the sponsors and senior management who have to approve the strategic steps, but equally important will be the regional and also local fleet managers. Don't ever underestimate all the local barriers. During the global fleet management event in Brussels and also raised before by, by Stephen, I've learned a new word. It's called global. Global, regional and local which explains perfectly the importance of all the involved people. Local stakeholders have to become the owner of the project. This will be key to receiving the required support from them and to understand also the local specification challenges and key drivers. And of course, never stop to communicate with this team. Secondly, in all situations, select only suppliers with the ability to fulfill all identified um, requirements in these markets as they are present. Not only the OEMs and car manufacturers, also the lease suppliers as well fleet management companies have to offer you at least a global presence and coverage, a central single point of contact, global strategic guidance and of course also the transparency across all markets. And thirdly, to prove the success of global fleet management, you will need to have access to consolidated reporting capabilities. It will help you keep the savings tracking system transparent and most importantly allows you to review the compliance of your strategy. On my next page, I will show you why it will be key to select the best partner from a lease supplier and a fleet management company. Let me introduce to you our three main chip sorry main objectives beside, of course, the global coverage itself. The global consultancy and strategic advice will help you to define a strategy from A to Z, and this will help you also to validate the feedback and insights you will receive from your local team members. 
In addition, dedicated consultants have a great insight into the market. As an example, benchmarking your current setup with industry peers and of course can help you uh, defining the best approach from a regional and local point of view to drive your local strategy beyond the target line. As a very good example, in, our, in GE, our own consultancy team of 45 plus people are dedicated specialists in their markets and regularly sharing best practices, market changes, key challenges, important information. Just to let you know, over the last two days, our team spent together face to face to leverage all our expertise and knowledge to further enlarge our offering and to fulfill all your future requirements because fleet is an involving industry. And it's also important that your partners provide you one single point of contact coordinating all consultancy projects so you can truly build a global approach. Second pillar is the global reporting. This is a key ask which was discussed at the conference, but this is not that easy. Some customers choose to build in-house which can be slow and costly, some buy it externally. We think this is a key requirement and in fact we will soon launch our new global dashboard which will offer data consolidation, standardization of reporting, monitoring of implementation compliance and later on also the ability to upload non-GE data. Third pillar of the strategy should be the global account management. It will give you the simplification of speaking to just one single point of contact who is reaching out to regions and countries ensuring the policy compliance, follow-up meetings on local level and communicating with suppliers in addition of course global SLAs, KPIs and transparency. Stephen, may I ask you to flip to the next page please? To underscore our expertise I would like to highlight just a few things on this page. Having the ability to, me uh, to measure results of all our studies in the past is enabling us to be transparent with the key successes for you in the future. Talking about sourcing, a key aspect is the enlarged power discussing with OEMs a consolidated buying approach across the globe. Most companies to work with up to 10 OEMs globally, if not even more. Selecting the best partners fulfilling all fleet requirements can lead into significant savings up to 10% on an annual scale, looking at the TCO basis. The type of funding. Selecting the best strategy on funding itself will be crucial for the future. Operational lease, capital lease, finance lease, purchasing the fleet itself or just using a fleet management. We can help you reviewing these, these challenges under the consideration of all factors. After having selected the best OEMs, taking a decision which kind of funding, pro, uh, funding product you would like to use in the future. Now I think it will be key to select the best in class cars to complete your requirements and the daily usage of the car itself. Of course this has to be done on a TCO scale and if implemented also in line with your local CO2 targets. Last but not least, you can heavily influence your cost reduction by having the correct contract duration. We see further trends across the globe to even review 54 months as a standard duration in, case the, in the case the car does not go beyond 180,000 kilometers in total. But bear in mind all tax regulations. It might change the approach of the funding methodology as it could swap from an operational to a capital lease. On the right hand side I would like to show you two examples of TCO pie charts. Let's quickly focus on just two major differences we can see. Looking at the duration, usually in Australia contracts are scheduled on a 36 month base and Japan on 60 months. Both countries use mostly an operational lease product but we see the same total mileage and Japan has 67 percent a longer duration. Looking at fuel, as Japan selects typically latest hybrid technology and also drives less of the total period, we can see that fuel has a lower impact compared to Australia, only 19 against 32 percent. Anyway, in addition to it, I would like to let you know, using those hybrid technologies in Japan, we figured out by our consultants that using them in bigger country, uh, cities, in reality mostly they're using less fuel as the manufacturers are letting you know watching at markets as like in Europe, we know hybrid cars will consume more fuel as they're mostly driven on uproad or motorways. If you're interested in even more markets and also the difference between passenger cars and service cars, don't hesitate to get in contact with me. I'm more than happy to share with you a recently completed document reviewing the United States, Mexico, Asia Pacific and of course Europe.
we will have now our Q&A session. I have already a first question uh, for Mr. Joe LaRosa. Um, Joe, the question is that, um, of course, Merck Schaben Dome is a global company and probably you will also add new countries and let's say emerging countries to your scope. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you deal with those new markets and emerging fleet markets when your global fleet policy is concerned and how do you deal with compliance? M m many of the emerging companies were uh, countries um, like, for example, like even in China, where we have a very small uh, fleet there, we do have some fleets there, but um, I'll be on a call actually mon Monday morning at 6 a.m. Uh, with, with India, and we're, we're, it's more about a cultural uh, type of thing where we're trying to introduce um, the cultural differences of managing fleets there, but I, I don't think... Um, um, any of the guiding principles really change and it's really more about an HR concept and we're just there to assist HR and assist in, in helping them understand the guiding principles and there it becomes more about um, you know do if they want to continue to provide an allowance program and that's really where the question becomes is that um, it, it, it uh, we have enough flexibility in the guiding principles where if they want to choose to have an allowance program and it's more about a cultural issue, we have enough flexibility in there that permits them to do that. So we have a broad statement there that allows the local HR to group to, uh, you know, uh, permits them to have an allowance program. Um, where it's a prominent and we have, um, HR has to decide that if, uh, and I think the statement is, is that um, the local, if 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 the, um, just trying to remember the wording, but it has to be a, a, a 65 percent group um, uh, participation rate. So, for example, if uh, if 65 percent of um, the market is uh, an allowance program within that within that grouping of pharmaceuticals, then they're permitted to to adapt. Uh, you know, adopt that. So that's how we're dealing with uh, those kind of broad spectrum ideas. If they if they want to go on a fleet program, then it becomes difficult then to value the benefit, and that's why we kind of kept that in there. So so we give uh, basically we don't want again, as I said before, we don't want to rule from a corporate level to say, look, you have to give them. A, a car in that situation. We really push it back to them to say, look, you have to do what the local market is doing, and if it's within a 65% uh, median or market, uh, then you have to basically decide locally what, what you want to provide them. So that's how we're dealing with the emerging markets. Okay, thank you, Joe. Um, another question, and it's a question from various people in the audience, is regarding your 21 guiding principles. Um, of course, the audience want to know a little bit more about that. Can you describe a little bit more some of those principles? Can you explain a little bit what are in those principles? What are some principles in those 21? Yeah, so the first the first guiding principle, like I said, had to do with HR. So again, just covering what I just said there, is that we uh, HR set out that they have to have um, they, at a corporate level is that the value of the benefit has to be at market median. So prior to the merger, Merck was at uh, below market median and sharing plow was above market median. So they had to come to grips and say, look, you only have to provide benefit at market median. Environmental health and safety, each country, each policy, every single country has to set a CO2 target. So they have to be at a baseline, they have to establish a baseline and then have to reduce their CO2 targets. And then they have uh, also with environmental health and safety, um, there is a corporate guideline. So every country has to set their CO2 targets based on the corporate guidelines. So for example, by 2020, they have to reduce their CO2 targets by the corporate guideline to 2020 by um, I think they have to get it down, um, 
I forget the number off the top of my head, but it's stated in the corporate guidelines. And then that gets reset every year, so they have to do that. And then from uh, the last the last six were uh, like fleet management, so they have to also uh, put in. Uh, yeah, my my colleague Joe Carrera is on the call. He said it's 95 grams per kilometer. Thank you, Joe Carrera, for giving me that uh, feed there. So good good teamwork there. Um, and then on fleet management, so. Um, they have to basically um, establish safety standards and so forth within the uh, within the uh, uh, policies lo written locally, and then also the, that they establish that um, essentially where they're they're picking cars that they have to have all the safety standards, so airbags, uh, ABS brakes, you know, in there, and then we get to review those uh, safety standards, so they can't pick cars locally. Um, and we get to review those spec sheets when they, uh, you know, when they get to uh, uh, select a vehicle, and they have to select those vehicles within uh, the the global procurement um, uh, guidelines. So when we select our OEMs, uh, the preferred suppliers, they have to locally negotiate with the global suppliers that we selected. If they cannot uh, have those global uh, suppliers, then they have to apply to the governance council for an exception. So those are the types of examples that we have in our 21 guiding principles. Okay, thank you, Joe. Um, a question for you both, but I would like to start with Florian. Um, Florian, um, the question is that um, you mentioned that uh, leasing terms uh, are moving, let's say, a little bit higher and also towards 50 months and even beyond that. Does, from your experience, does, you, does that mean that the lease period is becoming more important than mileage when you deal with uh, international fleet managers? No, to keep it simple. It's always a combination between the contract duration as well the mileage because at a certain point definitely maintenance service and tire costs will be getting higher than what you can save on the other hand side on the depreciation of the car itself and also in addition to it uh, as I said before at a certain point it might swap from a tax perspective into a negative direction for the customer if you're going into a, an operational lease product so it's always a fair mix between duration and mileage in combination. It has to be always the, the best solution for each individual different car. Okay. Um, Joe, uh, do you also see, let's say, an evolution in um, the, uh, the mileage and or um, the lease, uh, the leasing period within your contracts across the globe? And how do you deal with that? Yeah, so yeah, so yeah, I think you know we 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 kind of changed that. I mean, we we looked at uh, you know when when it's a very strong residual value market, you know we're we're considering uh, you know uh, e even in the U.S. market, which has had a very strong residual value market, we we we're almost ignoring now the uh, the period uh, of uh, months in service, and we're just strictly going based on you know uh, you know the mileage. Um, and, and we're we're a capital market, uh, capital spend market in the U.S. because of the way we're funding. Uh, so we need to be very flexible there. It, it kind of annoys our drivers a little bit, but uh, but and, and and we're you know we're we're an open-ended contract there, so we're we're taking the full residual risk on on the contracts there. But in in um, a lot of the contracts, even in Latin America, I say where where it's a bought and purchased market, and and the uh, uh, the drivers uh, have kind of like skin in the game with uh, they're buying you know up to almost 50 or 60 percent of the of, of the you know purchase price of the vehicle uh, it's it's much more diffi difficult to um, uh, adjust um, you know the, uh, the the you know the uh, term of the vehicle so uh, we have no flexibility there. Uh, but you know, in, in Europe, uh, that's a very hot debate that we've had with HR. But I think we're overcoming that because I think management there is realizing uh, the cost and, and the savings to the company, 
and I think uh, I think it's being pushed down to to local management and HR, and I think they're becoming more in tune with that, um, and and I think we're overcoming past um, debate on that and pushback. And uh, a Asia Pac, I think uh, there they've always driven the cars much lengthier terms, uh, especially in Japan. They've always driven the cars there for 60 months, so there's really almost no question or debate there. So uh, I, th I think we're doing there pretty good. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question for you, Joe. You stated that all outsourced partnerships are the way forward. Do you then see uh, one key partner across all of m or most countries uh, across the globe uh, where it's possible, or are you finding that different partners for different markets works best? What is your feeling? Yeah, I, 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 again, I think we, we try to define, um, we, we've been working on this for a while, as, as you can imagine, and, you know, we, we, we raised the bar up to like 80%. If we, we were going to be satisfied where if we could find one partner that could cover us for 80%, we were going to be satisfied. And then we said, well, that, you know, we're not going to find anybody for 80%. So we, we kind of dropped it down to 70%. And then we weren't really satisfied with that. But I, I don't think there's really one one outsourced partner that's going to get you there. So it's going to have to be multiple. And I just think it's such a changing market. And I think, um, you know, because of, uh, and I'll, I'll just say Latin America, you could, you know, you could find supplier that could cover you for, you know, for, for, for Mexico as part of North America, but that doesn't fit in with the way Merck operates. Um, you know, if I if I went to uh, my Mexico managing director and say, "Oh, by the way, we're going to manage your fleet out of North America," he wouldn't agree with that. He wants his own management team down there uh, to be managed by a Mexican provider. Uh, and yet, if I tried to manage, you know, uh, Brazil with a non Latin American country, I would get the same feedback from from there. You know, uh, so it's a cultural thing. It's it's um, uh, they each of the countries want to be handled kind of like an assurance that they have their own um, their own local con co you know company being managed you know and that's very difficult to do so uh, with with one one company you know uh, so we're we're going to try to remix it and 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 you know keep keep pushing the bar a little bit with our providers and say look even you know, we're, we're looking at it now and say, look, even if you have, um, you know, alliances, we'll, we'll accept that. But if, even at that, we're finding that the alliances are, are loose at best. And but we're, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna wait and see, and, and hopefully we'll push the envelope a little bit with our current providers, and keep pushing the envelope a little bit with that. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, set set some precedent. And, and we're not the only ones doing this. I'm sure there's other companies that see it our way as well. Okay, thank you, Joe. Um, a question for Florian. Florian, um, you talked about having a strong mandate. Also, Joe did that, uh, and even I already mentioned it in the trends uh, of our Global Fleet Conference. But uh, can you tell us a little bit more how you can secure that mandate and the momentum internally and externally once that you have the mandate? So, how? What, from your experience, uh, is needed to keep, let's say, the ball rolling? It's one keyword. It's called communication from the beginning on. Really, as soon as you have the mandate, make sure, as I said before earlier, identify the right people you have to speak to in all the regions as well locally, and keep them informed. As long as they do have all the information, what the next step will be, or either what might be the outcome for them in the future out of this project, it means they're on board, they're feeling comfortable, they, they do have, all everyone have the impression to be within the driver's seat. And that's where it can keeps you the momentum, keeps you the, the, the mandate and uh, then of course when it comes to the decision period itself, you need to communicate also to the stakeholders who gave you the mandate. So sometimes it's also good to give a short brief update on where you're standing, that's up to the senior side and to the other people, you have to work really closely together with all the fleet managers in the regions, making sure you communicate. That's really key to success. Joe, 
can you confirm that and how do you deal with that? How do you organize your communication to internal stakeholders? Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, uh, essentially I agree with everything, you know, <clears throat> what Florian just said, yeah. So, yeah, we, we have, um, you know, when I had a, <laughs> had a staff of 12, uh, we, we would have regular meetings, uh, but uh, I think now that uh, our change in management, we've, uh, we've now uh, started reporting into indirect procurement. Uh, so for the last six months, we've been kind of in a in a hiatus, and I used to regularly have meetings, um, you know, with uh, with with our internal stakeholders, um, and now um, we're we're on a project now with our, our flow, you know, for our data consolidation, as well as our um, our you know fleet management and our fleet leasing. Uh, so we're now going to regularly you know push out. Our findings on our fleet management to our stakeholders. So we're regrouping right now, and we are now getting pushed back from our Asia PAC team as to, hey, you haven't communicated to us. And uh, I used to report into facilities management, and I used to have regular communications with the facilities management team, who who are the ones that are in our uh, in in the wake of um, <coughs> of uh, you know the kind of the storm there that. Uh, our, our kind of uh, internal stakeholders that are helping us administer fleet, and uh, my uh, four team members now are still in kind of direct contact, and we are communicating with them. Uh, but at a higher level, uh, we're getting some pushback now as to, hey, you haven't communicated with us on that. So, so if you don't communicate that, they these guys get a little antsy as to, hey, what's going on with fleet management, and. Um, you know we're we're trying to do the best we can with uh, quarterly meetings uh, to do that, but uh, we need we need to get up to snuff on that, and uh, we we hope to do that pretty soon. But but that's how we do that, and even even from a uh, a governance uh, you know, with that, I used to hold uh, uh, yeah, meetings every other every other month, and that has slipped as well, and it and it it falls apart pretty quickly if you don't communicate. Fleet is very close to the uh, to the heart of many people, and uh, if you don't communicate at a high level, they get very antsy on what's happening. Okay, um, as time is running out, um, a final question for the both of you. I will start with Joe La Rosa. Joe, um, if there is one thing that you would do differently with what you know now, what would it be, and how would you do it? Yeah, I think I think the the one thing that I would do differently is is that uh, have more emphasis on on the CO2 um, levels in the car list. I think in the very beginning we struggled with uh, getting uh, you know Comp and Ben um, to uh, you know to work with us on on the levels of vehicles, and everybody wanted a, you know an S SUV vehicle. And uh, it became very difficult to try to get that policy changed. We struggled with that. I think you know having Comp and Ben and HR work with us uh, closely, uh, more closely on that would have been uh, one of the things that would have changed. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Joe. And my final question for Florian. Florian, um, what do and what don't do you have for our international fleet managers thinking about going global? And you can't, of course sell your own company in this answer? Um, nothing I would do anyway in that moment, to be honest. Um, for, first of all, I just would like to add one comment in regards to the, the question before speaking about communication. It's not just one direction, and this is also something that belongs to do and don'ts. One, uh, communication should be in both directions. means also listen to your local stakeholders, concerns they may have, insights they may have from the drivers itself because it always every single cost saving initiative you're driving should have the right balance between the financial cost reduction as well also the motivation within your staff. Um, as do's and don'ts, it takes a while to get the global fleet management installed properly. It's nothing you can do within just a second or a minute. Um, you have to have a proper plan in mind and make sure when you're selecting your partners, and as I said before, if it's the OEM, the lease supplier or fleet management company, that they really can 
fulfill the requirements you're asking for. There is always somehow a round of advertisement and later on it comes to the truth. So uh, try to test them, keep yourself open the, the ability to make changes if it doesn't work out immediately and a clear do is definitely keep everyone involved in this project who has to be involved um, to make it to a success story. Okay, thank you very course, much. There are a lot of, lot of don'ts. <laughs> Yes, I can imagine. Thank you very much, Florian. Um, this is the end of the webinar. I want to thank once again both expert speakers and uh, GE for being our partner. I also want to thank all of you for your uh, attendance. Have a great day and thank you very much. Bye-bye.